下面有请 Google 产品管理副总裁 l e a r o n 先生给我们带来精彩分享——后移动时代。Hi everyone,、uh, very excited to be here today in this giant tank with geeks, entrepreneurs, and product builders. And I'm excited because. I fundamentally believe that great product builders are changing the world through building products, and thanks to all of you, there's many, many more of those products created today in China than ever before. For me, great products represent progress, change, innovative, functional, beautiful progress, and products are. Destroying barriers, unleashing creativity, unlocking economical progress. And what I'm hoping to do today with you is share some of my journey as a product leader at Google over the past、uh, decade, in the hopes that it will help you think about your products、uh, slightly differently. And because I think about my products as babies. I thought I'll put some of my advice into that context. How do you grow and nurture a baby or a product? So the first thing you do with a baby, how does it come to the world? It starts small, and it creates magic, and that's what great products、um, are all about. This is Google Maps. When I joined Google and launched my first product almost 10 years ago, started very small. Two countries only, a vast blue ocean between them, no, almost no data, no driving directions, no businesses, but magic. For the first time, being able to browse, pan, zoom very freely on the map, and the reason we were able to do that is by marrying a technical insight and a user insight. The technical insight was, for the first time, there was a new technology called AJAX that allowed to do very efficient rendering on the browser client side. So we were able to provide that free browsing. The user insight was that users just wanted to roam freely and browse around and check their geographies in a very quick way. And by marrying the technical insight and the user insight, you truly create magic. As a matter of fact, I can't think of a single product in Google, and all the products that succeeded were able to create and combine the user insight and the technical insight. Search, the technical insight was we can actually rank the web with links. The user insight, we can provide that search in a very clear, clean search box. Gmail, the technical insight, we can now offer unlimited storage for the first time. The user insight: users have so many emails they can actually search. They want to search for their、uh, emails. So, first thing is combine those insights, start small, and grow from there. When you want growing like a baby, it's very easy to take baby steps. But real innovation and real growth happens when you encourage your baby or your product to take big steps to push. Your baby and product out of your comfort zone. When we launched Google Maps, we wanted to grow it to the next stage by tapping into the millions of users globally and asking them to contribute their local knowledge. Because after all, we're the biggest local experts for our cities, for our neighborhoods. So we thought, hey, if we tweak Google Maps just a bit. By just an inch, we'll be able to ask all of those millions of users to start contributing and engaging with the community, and share their knowledge. So we've launched hundreds of experiments and dozens of products. You see some of those here, and guess what? None of them truly succeeded. And the reason none of them truly succeeded is because users just came to Maps with the expectation to search, to browse. To get driving directions, and that's it. Their mental model was not about community and engaging and contributing. To do that and to grow the product, you need to fundamentally change the user expectation. You need to you need to take your users out of the comfort zone 
you need to completely rethink the product. So as we were experimenting with all of those ways to tweak Google Maps, in Israel, a great startup called Waze completely rethought the map UI, put people as first uh, citizens on the map, put all those icons, that community feeling, completely reset expectation about users coming to Maps. As a consequence, they grew the real community, and Google acquired them after a couple of years for a billion users, for a billion dollars. So always push the envelope, reset expectation if you actually want to grow and don't be caught in the incremental way. Change happens fundamentally, not incrementally. The next thing you do, you adopt a mindset of a three-year-old. What do three-year-olds do? They ask. They are constantly driven by endless curiosity to understand the nature of things behind the reality they perceive. So they always ask why. As a product leader, you need to ask why on your product all the time. We're very happy with ways and driving directions on Google Maps, millions and almost billions of users using, using driving directions, but we never actually stop to ask why. Why are they asking for driving directions? Are they in the business of taking driving directions? Is that their hobby? No. If we ask why and think about it deeply, the answer is they're taking driving directions because all they want is to get from point A to point B. That's the deep need behind the reality. And services like Uber and Didi fulfill that need for those users in a much more deeper and engaging way. Again, asking why. What is your user actually trying to achieve with your product? And the last thing is never compromise, like with your kids, set the boundaries on what matters. Never compromise on the essentials, on what actually matter for your product. Four years ago, I joined Motorola after Google acquired it to lead uh, the product team. And when I joined, this was the landscape of the smartwatch market. You all remember that only two years ago, these were the smartwatches on the market. But what those products were missing is actually thinking about what's fundamental for someone wearing a smartwatch. Is it the smart or is it the watch? And the answer is the watch. We all wear watches on us because they're beautiful, because they're a statement on who we are and what we want to communicate to others. So the fundamental essence of a product in that category is being beautiful. So that's what we set out to do in Motorola, and we, we got going, we've realized that in order to create a watch, a real watch, it has to be round. That's how time was perceived and communicated from the early days of history, from sundials to public watches to wrist watches. Time is communicated in a circle, and if we want to create a genuine watch, it has to be round. Now. We've done endless iterations to get it to a technology, and it's very tempting as a product leader to stop because it's super hard and just launch something to get going. Those were all versions of the watch that were ready to ship, and it took a lot of discipline to actually be patient and stop and not launch and continue to iterate until we've actually developed the full technology that allow us for the first time to launch a fully round watch, and we've launched Model 360 for great success uh, more than two years ago. So be disciplined and launch only when you have the essence of your product ready. Now let's move uh, to my favorite product nowadays, self-driving cars. We've heard a lot about them uh, today, and I wanted to uh, give you a bit of behind the scenes um, on self-driving cars at Google. First of all, Back to our product analogy, very simple, super simple product, right? All it needs to do for the user is drive, is go or stop or drive left or steer right. That's all the product is doing. And all you can do as a user to communicate with the product is press the big red button to stop and take control. Super simple product for the user. Behind the scenes, amazing uh, complexity and really an amazing potential to transform society in a very deep way. 
from eliminating road accidents that are taking 1.2 million lives, unnecessary lives, every year globally on the roads, to eliminate traffic jams and road congestion. In the US, an average commute is 50 minutes per day per person. If you multiply that, you get to 6 billion minutes every day that are wasted. If you actually calculate the, how many lives that that equal, there's 162 lifetimes wasted on the road every day. And based on my experience in the last two days in Beijing and that traffic jam, I think the waste here is even bigger. So huge potential to actually save traffic jams. And by that, and taking cars off the road, getting cities healthier and vastly reducing pollution and claiming back the air in many, many cities across the world. And after that, really enabling freedom and mobility for a vast expense of users that are unable to ride today, like Steve, who is blind and is spending hours every day trying to commute back and forth to his workplace. So huge potential. Let's see a bit uh, behind the scenes of how it works. So first of all is the map. The car is booting. Look at the world around, uh, around it. Perceive the sensors and align the sensors and the data with the map that it has to localize and know where it is. After that, the car will perceive the objects around it and identify what they are. In that example, we have some purple boxes for cars. We have a red box for a bicyclist. And if you look all the way in the end, you'll see some orange dots for uh, construction cones. After identifying those objects, we now actually need to identify where that object is going. So in that example, a pickup truck is going to break left because it's going to uh, hit a construction zone, so it's merging back to the lane. We need to know where it's going. Not only that, we need to know where every car and every object on the road are actually going, which, which is a huge computational challenge. If we're able to solve that computational challenge, a very simple product in the end. We have a lane for the car to steer itself, stop, go, right, left. And this is essentially the new map. Map 1.0 was all about Google Maps, relatively static. Map 2.0 is much more dynamic, Waze-like. Map 3.0, the map that we need for self-driving cars, is much more high fidelity, real time, always updated, very complex. So if we can play the movie, please. This is how the car perceived the world around, around it. That's some of the laser data. We can see the yellow boxes for bicyclists, the purple boxes for cars. Um, and then when it starts driving, it perceives the road, the road around it. And for example, identify cones and know how to merge and navigate based on the cones. Doesn't only need to identify cones, it also needs to identify any car. So it needs to know if a car has some flashing light on top of it, it's actually a police car, and you need to stop and veer left. It needs to know that that orange box is actually a school bus, and I have to stop and be patient as the school bus actually merge into traffic. It needs to understand what pedestrians and bicyclists, what humans are doing on the road, and if a bicyclist is actually waving his hand, it probably will merge into the road. And if a police officer is raising his hand, he's probably want to stop, and he's waving his hand, he probably want to go. So those cars are learning by sharing that knowledge between them. In the very simplistic example here, the cars will share with each other the new construction zone. Now all of them know that there's a construction there and they'll be smarter. But they share much more than that. They share a much deeper understanding of every car they've seen on the road, of every pedestrian they've seen on the road, of every object they've ever encountered. So they can all collectively learn and identify what objects will they actually see in the future. Once they see those objects, they need to identify where they're going. So a bicycle crossing the road, a motorcycle merging from the parking side into the road, a bicycle is going downhill and you know going at us, a car making a right turn, and even 
perceiving that a car is going to make a U-turn and stopping just before it actually does that. So we can learn a lot of things, but there's always the unexpected um, that could never be actually taught. So uh, if we roll the next video, this is a real encounter of a car um, that drove in Mountain View a few months ago. If we can roll the second video. And what we see here roaming around Mountain View is a woman in a wheelchair chasing a duck in circles on the road. And there's nothing in the driving handbook that actually prepares you to encounter the duck. It's not only in the duck. There's a many, many more examples of unexpected things that we encounter. If we can roll the third video. Everything from a bird crossing the road and the car responding to bicyclists that you can only encounter on the Google campus to some small drivers occupying the road to a trucker jumping out of his truck exactly to our lane to someone, a car taking, cutting us just in the last second before the turn or a car merging into the lane. We're just about to merge and have to avoid it to a car that crosses the road in red light and us knowing it's going to happen and stopping or to the bicyclist that crosses the road in the red light, we are stopping, but the other vehicles are almost running him over. Or even that driver, they decided for some reason it's a good idea to get in between two self-driving cars. If you ask me, not the best idea for him. So many, many, many learnings, and we continue to perfect the technology. We've driven over 1 million automated miles to date. We are driving more than 3 million simulated miles in our simulation environment on our computers every day to test the technology and to understand where we are. We've made amazing progress and we aim to bring the technology to market in this decade. Thank you. <laughs>